Okay. Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our biotech session. This session is basically sponsored by Instant Nanobiosensor. And this is actually a series of uh, scientific innovations in the field of neuroscience and other areas, uh, especially related to biotechnology. Uh, today we are having the first chapter and in future we will have more chapters related to this technology. Uh, so if I will give you a brief introduction about Instant Nano Biosensor, it is an award winning Taiwanese company specialized in the development of cutting edge biosensor platforms. It was established in 2016 uh, by co-founder Tony Sheng, who is with us today. He's also the CEO of the company. And we uh, like Huan Xiao and Xiao Chunpal Wang, the, this inspiring technology com uh, biotechnology company operates on the mission to continuously improve the biomedical research and diagnostic processes with simple, reliable, and affordable detection solutions. Uh, it basically works on fiber optic particle uh, plasmon resonance technology, which is basically a light sensing biomarker analyzer platform. Today we have two speakers with us. Before I give you introduction about our speakers, I would like to tell you this session is being recorded and it will be uploaded later on, on our YouTube channel. You can, you're always welcome to share the video with your colleagues or researchers who are working in the same area of biotech or, and you can also watch it later and also approach us later if you have any questions. The layout of our session today is first I will give the introductions and then we will have uh, presentations by each of our respective speakers. After that, there will be question and answers and then there will be a closing, closing remarks. So first, with that note, first I would like to introduce Dr. Gansun. He is a professor in biological and agriculture engineering in UC Davis, California. His research activities include the development of functional materials for biological protections, including chlorine rechargeable and daylight induced biocide materials for PPE and personal use sensor for antibiotics and etc. Dr. Gangson's career uh, received career award from US National Science Foundation in 1997 and the Olney Medal in 2016, the highest science award from American Association of Textile Chemists and Colorists. He is currently serving as the Editor-in-Chief of AATCC Journal of Research and has published over 300 peer-reviewed journal articles. Today, uh, he will be talking about his one publication uh, which is related to ELISA and also it can be uh, implemented later on to the immunotherapy field. The topic of his presentation will be design and fabrication of a highly sensitive and naked eye distinguishable colorimetric biosensor for chloramphenicol detection by using ELISA on nanofibrous membranes. So I would like to introduce our second speaker and then I will give the floor to Dr. Gangson. Our second speaker today is Tony Chung. He's the CEO and chairman of Instant Nano Biosensors Taiwan. Uh, he is uh, he has a wide experience in biotech uh, industry, especially in the field of life sciences, clinical research, and molecular diagnostics. And he has accumulated wealth of management experience, practical experiences in the business strategy planning, business development, sales, marketing, project, and team management since 2001. He received his BSc degree in animal science and biotech and MSc degree in molecular biology and cell biology from university in Taiwan. So with that note, I welcome to both of you that you joined today's event. It's really a, like uh, we are really honored to have uh, uh, both of you in one platform. And I would like to give the floor now to Dr. Gangson. And if you would like to uh, show us about your work and talk more about that. Thank you. Okay, it's my turn, right? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. Good afternoon and good morning to uh, Mr. Chuang. And, uh, and uh, thanks for your introduction, Noim, and, uh, and also the opportunity to speak in this forum here. Um, obviously, um, we actually, as you introduced, uh, that when you see where the uh, the bio, bio, you know, biotechnology uh, people, but we're we, we sometimes I always feel a little bit worried because uh, um, you, based on your introduction, you probably see that uh, we're more in the fiber, in the material science areas. So, so anyway, and um, 
I'm going to just share my screen and to discuss uh, the materials development area. And uh, so we actually collaborate with many other people, particularly working on the bio, uh, biological science related applications. And uh, we're fundamentally still uh, claim ourselves as a material scientist. So I slightly changed the title. So I'm using the so-called ELISA nanofibrous membranes for naked eye distinguishable calorimetric detection of chemicals. So in fact, you're going to see mostly we're using the chlorophenicol, which is an antibiotic and uh, as a, one of the major uh, target. So here, the work actually is mostly done by Dr. Chun Yi Zhou. He is also in the audience. In case there are more technical, detailed questions, and uh, Dr. Zhou is the, the best person to respond. And uh, Bo Feng is still working on any continuation in this area. In fact, uh, he is developing new materials, and uh, and uh, and because whichever we learn from this research. We have some kind of ideal uh, uh, design for the structures of this, uh, the personal use sensors and for uh, the use of uh, ELISA related or large molecules, protein samples. And um, so Bofeng is working on this and also including some of the recent his work on, the, on even the uh, detection of the COVID and the virus. Okay, so. Here is, we always have unexpected uh, and exposures to tax, toxic chemicals in our daily life. Mostly happening to, our, uh, to this would be the pesticides and also antibiotics. But in this talk, probably we see we are using antibiotics as one of the examples because we are having antibiotics in our daily, uh, mostly in the food. And we're using one in the, in the seafood and commonly used them mostly in overseas and heavily controlled in U.S. as well of our target as an example. Most of the common uh, detection methods used for um, uh, evaluating this uh, detection, uh, this compound are the LCMS and obviously they have a high sensitivity. Although there's also the immuno LC methods such as the ELISA, so I will mention those things. But uh, all of them, you use the equipment and also uh, instruments and also uh, you know train the people. Hard to be used by the ordinary public, and uh, so we are uh, nowadays we have an increased interest uh, for the personal use, particularly for the consumers. Just like we we nowadays have all these COVID tests and uh, the antigen tests as well. So if you look at the uh, Eliza. And mostly we have the so-called so uh, 96 well ELISA uh, SC. And basically you have this, uh, 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 you know, this is the solvent related and uh, um, a detection process, very common and widely used. And it's fast. The advantage is the fast and the convenient to use, but it's the limitation is uh, relatively restricted uh, uh, sensitivity, but you also need, have to use uh, uh, an instrument or devices to read it. And also there's paper-based ELISA, and uh, they have they bear the same uh, disadvantage. And this is all related to the amount of this antibodies attached on the surface of the materials, and uh, which will affect these uh, detection levels and uh, also the exposure levels to the target chemicals. So which is the idea that we think that the, whether we could increase the uh, increase the amount of these uh, 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 antibodies on the surface of the detecting materials. So we do have some because we are the, the material people and we actually make a, all kinds of different the nanofibrous membranes. And if you look at the mem uh, nanofibrous membrane structures, and the people have used it and made it in all different ways in the structures. So you're going to see the nanofiber uh, structure we describe it as a microporous nanofibers uh, because uh, you do see the pore, the pore size is big. And also you do see the fiber size is uh, very fine. So I put a kind of a, a typical 
and kind of a description here uh, is that, uh, uh, let me find the words. That, uh, the, uh, so, Um, so I still use the cursor. So, um, so you see here is the fiber size actually normally we make is around 100 to 500 nanometer. And the pore size um, and it goes to several micrometers and also in a way that uh, is controllable and, uh, 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 by the manufacturing process. So we're thinking now and uh, with this uh, the use of this nanofibrous structures, we're going to have a more surface area. The specific surface area of the material per volume and per weight obviously will be uh, in, uh, can be measured in this way. And uh, with a much higher, we call the increase of the specific area. If we reduce the size of the fiber uh, uh, from micrometer to nanometer, so you're expecting that, that there would be 1,000 times increase of the specific air surface areas. So based on this, the physical, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the structures, obviously we also would ex expect that, that there, uh, there would be a significant amount of the antibody loaded onto the surface. And obviously there would be a, a subsequent uh, increase of um, the sensitivity. Okay. So that is the idea, and, and so we start to develop those things. We use uh, obviously simple one would be the the electro spinning. We make this nanofibrous membrane. We go through those uh, chemical immobilization process and attaching the antibody onto it. We do this with the different uh, and the similar strategies, the competitive ELISA process, and then you're able to finally see a user kind of dying fluorescent dye and showing this signal and indicating the amount and the exposed the level of these target chemicals. And here is the interesting part because due to the process of those, uh, um, the method, the signal intensity is inversely uh, 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 coordinating to the concentration. So you're going to see the color change, but regardless, the color uh, indicate and uh, the color, color variation indicated this type of uh, uh, detection of the or exposure of the chemical to the material. So we use a different chemistry and uh, attaching the antibody here is more specifically we use the term of the protein. So we have a different uh, uh, structures and obviously as different uh, chemical connection brings in the different uh, reactivity and different uh, sensitivity and the, for uh, and the stability and so on. We do have the way to characterize and confirm the structures. So, and also we use it for detection. So here we directly use a fluorescent uh, attach the IgG as a, uh, as a signal to see how well these uh, yeah, uh, and uh, directly uh, incorporate immobilizing this IgG onto the surface of the membranes. So obviously you see the increase in different amount of this IgG and uh, with the different uh, use of this different connection method, you do see uh, kind of increase the signal, which is consistent. But in fact, when you convert them into a reaction uh, efficiency, and obviously there's a, a different interpretation. So we don't want to go into the chemistry too much. I just want to see, we do have the success and showing that uh, we're able to make it. And in fact, uh, the DSC, which is uh, uh, would be a better one. So we use this and um, made and connected in uh, with this, the antibody of the coral uh, phenicol, which is uh, represented as a, uh, uh, the cap CEP here. So when we do this, we do a systematic uh, uh, the measurement by varying different concentrations of these exposure levels, and also in the, in the exposure time. And obviously, it, you see the signals are related to it. It's under different uh, uh, chemistry, which is uh, connected uh, uh, by different uh, chemicals. And the st structurally speaking, you'll see here is at a lower concentration, you do see some 
more sensitive to the time, the exposure time, at the high concentration, relatively uh, less sensitive to the concentration, uh, uh, to the exposure time. And uh, this is the related to the C, uh, like this is the, say, CC. Sorry, any question? Uh, this is the cyanuric uh, chloride, and also there's a, this is the growth of aldehyde, this is the DSC, which is a carbody um, uh, imid uh, coupling, coupling agent, so which is commonly used for connecting the proteins and uh, immobilizing uh, protein molecules onto the surface of the different structures. So regardless, and um, we think that uh, the DSC actually provides the much more consistent and uh, better signal so we don't want to go into all the details because we still have a little bit more slides to show in the limited time. So anyway, basically, and the initial uh, test showed some kind of good success. And uh, so we compare our ELISA on um, nanofibrous membrane. So obviously we'll see there's a diff depending on different exposure level to the cat or in the hall. Sorry. It's echo or my echo? It's an um, echo from someone. Okay, it's an echo from myself, maybe. Um, anyway, and uh, also here, um, you do see the intensity of the color changes with the more, uh, uh, the, uh, con uh, with the increase, the concentration of the cat. And eventually more and would uh, have a lighter color. This is the, uh, whichever I said that, that the, the signal intensity is inversely re, uh, 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 correlating to the uh, the signal uh, to the concentration of the target chemical here. So whichever you see that we also measured the, the, the sharp difference and around the the concentration uh, change around the point one to point uh, three uh, um, uh, ppb level. So which means that uh, our uh, we have a, a kind of pretty sensitive. This is the, the color change actually is visible to our naked eyes. And here, comp in comparison to natty 6 well plate, which is commonly used by the biologist, and also another one, which is a paper-based, the nitrocellulose paper-based. And their, intense, uh, their uh, detection level would be relatively low. So I will see that how do we evaluate and compare and find out the detection limit of this uh, different uh, structures. So here is a comparison. And also you will see here is um, the lowest detection uh, distinguishable uh, concentration from the nano, uh, nanofibrous membrane goes to the point one. Actually, it's a similar to the 96 well, but we also need to uh, remember that we are actually are using our next eye, naked eyes, and we go for 0.3, they go for a little bit high. So regardless, we do see the improvement of the use of the nanofibrous membrane in improve, uh, increase the sensitivity. But also there's a little bit of uh, disappoint, uh, point, uh, disappointment because of, if you still remember that I said, that we, the use of the nanofibrous membranes would uh, increase the surface area for almost 1,000 times. And then, then we should expect it to have a much higher uh, improvement in the sensitivity, but obviously we did not achieve it. Even though we have some of the improvement is not whichever we were expecting. So no. So now we would like to see um, uh, additionally, what would it be uh, 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 next and also improvement. But if, before we do that, we also did, did some kind of real uh, live test. We tested with uh, a different uh, uh, samples purchased and also spiked the samples. We were able to really do it. This is the uh, real sample testing scenario. And also and mix it with the different other uh, uh, antibiotics commonly used in the seafood. And uh, obviously the selectivity of this uh, uh, material is very obvious and uh, uh, only for the, uh, the chlorophenicol, which is also reasonable because we use the ELISA. Okay, so now we also analyze this because uh, again, I want to emphasize our strengths is the in the material science area. So we try to see why the improvement of the sensitivity uh, never reached to the expectation. And we understand that there are some kind of structural fe uh, failure 
and from this nanofibrous membrane. So you will understand, and we actually have done a more systematic studies and try to find out what, where are they are and where those antibodies are connected or immobilized onto this. We found, unfortunately, most of those antibodies still were immobilized on the surface, not inside. And uh, we realized that there's a serious issue. And there are issues would be and that there's a more crowded, crowded effect on the surface. Second one, well, actually, there is a diffusion of the large molecules into the uh, porous structure. Even though we believe we thought that the, the nanoporous, nano-sized porous would, pore would be larger enough, but due to the special structural feature of this um, uh, membrane structure, and that the diffusion is not um, uh, as um, as we uh, expect in this in, in the structure. So we have done some kind of study. So we try to vary the pore size of structures by uh, using different uh, manufacturing uh, steps. So we were able to control the pores and also we 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 we, we uh, those of the conditions. But anyway, the overall here I just want to tell you that. The, we actually have a higher surface, uh, a higher pore size, but eventually the fibers are much more coarser to get much pore, uh, uh, high pores. And also here would be really in the nano, this actually goes to the micro, and this would be the distributions of the pore, uh, uh, the pore size and uh, uh, in the region. And then also we use a different uh, uh, biomolecules um, and, uh, uh, and uh, attached with the uh, uh, the fluorescent uh, marker, try to see their diffusion pattern. And obviously we found out that indeed, the larger size or small size do have a different uh, um, uh, diffusion performance. And uh, particularly here is the FITC, there's an, uh, this is the, just the, the, the bar mark, uh, this is the just fluorescent marker, it's the smallest molecule with the only, uh, uh, I think of, uh, uh, um, so, uh, 4K uh, dirt time. And also we have the 150K and, and uh, with the dextrin and structures and with the, also with the fluor fluorescent marker. And also you see the concentration of these represents the smaller pore and the smaller uh, and, and the smaller uh, diameter and the, diff the, the permeability or the diffusion of the large molecules would be significantly lower. And obviously the small molecule would go higher. Large pores also would have a better and diffusion of the molecules. So overall, we think that we have to make some of this improvement in the uh, micropore structures in order to achieve better and uh, performance. But indeed we did. And uh, Remember, these four structures, they have a varied fiber diameter and also varied pore size. From A to D, eventually this is the smaller fiber size, actually smaller fiber size and smaller pores represents under the same volume or the same mass of the membrane, you have higher surface area. And also here represents the higher uh, pore size and also large fiber diameter but you do have a reduced surface area. But overall, when you see those, you develop them into different, uh, 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 you know, immobilized with the similar, uh, the, uh, the, the, the biomarkers, you're gonna find out that uh, eventually these uh, limited the surface or the reduce of the surface area perform similar to the large ones, representing that uh, the large, molecules, particularly the antibody, would prefer to go through the large pore system and also diffuse more rapidly and evenly into the system. So that gave us some kind of uh, and, uh, uh, a hint for the improvement. So we did make uh, uh, improve the sensitivities of using the, in, uh, the varied uh, and uh, nanofibrous membrane structures. So now you see, and uh, using this, uh, the new structural morphology with the uh, larger pole and the control of the fiber size, and the sensitivity of this new membrane is still the same chemistry, same uh, and uh, the same antibody and the same and uh, um, target. 
the sensitivity increased in another round. So here it tells you that the detection limit goes to the 0.005. Uh, uh, this in terms of the PPB would be the PPB. So this is the significant improvement and of the sensitivity. So anyway, now we have a, a new membranes material and uh, uh, with the ability that uh, to improve this sensitivity and also with the ability to show the naked eye detection concentration at the even lower concentration. And um, so that really a uh, representation of uh, the improve the surface area, increase the surface area and improve the uh, sensitivity. And uh, with the control of this uh, structure of the, the nanofiber membrane, we believe that we still have the potential to further improve and increase the sensitivity. Anyway, so I just want to uh, conclude that we do have other uh, new approaches, but I don't think we have time to cover all of them. So membrane structures, nanofibrous membrane structures could increase the sensitivity of the elastic assay. So we, we think this would be a good material. And also the proper modified membranes just show the high sensitivity and also very stable and distinguishable calorimetric sensor, uh, signals, which uh, could be used for the development of different sensors. And um, also that uh, we think this uh, would be applicable for different uh, chemicals and the uh, toxic chemicals or pesticides. In fact, uh, Chen Yi has done a lot of uh, different uh, uh, applications and detected for pesticides and toxins from mushroom and so on. And the Guofeng also used the same strategy, strategy working with the other groups and uh, to detect that it's uh, COVID and viruses and using the same one. Although um, when you detected the COVID, I think that there are a lot of different similar product, products on the market. So anyway, with this, I would like to see, we have to acknowledge those funding agencies and uh, provided the, the, uh, the money to, uh, for our research. And also I would uh, like to thank the organizer and thank everyone. And also would be happy to uh, answer the questions. And also, Chen uh, Yi and the Bofeng could also answer uh, the questions as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Gang. It was really interesting presentation. We will go to our uh, question and answer sessions afterwards. Uh, first, now I would like to um, welcome Dr. Uh, Tony Chen, the CEO of Instant Nano Biosensors, to uh, like present about this cutting edge technology for um, biomarker assays. It is almost equivalent to ELISA. Uh, you can see that how this, techno this technology is based on life and he will explain us how this is completely revolutionary and how it can just change the dynamics of such assays in a diagnostic and therapeutic fields. So uh, thanks Tony for joining us today and I will give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Noy. Thank you, uh, Professor Gensong Kipper. Um, uh, very good uh, speech up with uh, uh, his study. And uh, uh, this is Tony Zong, and uh, thanks for your time to join this webinar. And um, I would like to introduce our um, another proper uh, sensor and also the um, how to apply to the, um, um, the science scenes. Um, we people like step life through our proper technology and our um, mission is to become the pioneer and leader of a digital protein biomarker solution provider from the analysis of the life science to the diagnostic through our optical fiber uh, sensors. Uh, some uh, news I just like to uh, uh, let you to know, we've been selected uh, over 500 um, biotech company as the Merck strategic partner. Um, so the, as you can both um, their website and see our company information. And also um, during these uh, three years, um, in the past two years, we've been uh, invited by um, Appcan, um, their webinar in uh, APEC uh, mentioned about our company and also to present our uh, product and service to their uh, users. And also this year we will have the a workshop, but, but due to a pandemic we will postpone to the August. So let's go uh, how we, um, 
approach and apply these uh, FOPA technology to the real world. As we know, the existing solution today, if we do not feel well, the symptoms uh, will show just like the upper of the iceberg. Need to go to the hospital to check what's the below the water surface of the iceberg. By using the invasive way to drop the spinal fluid or using the capital equipment uh, like a CT or PET. Um, during the pandemic, um, these moments, uh, I think the centralization is not a good solution for the uh, um, those of the um, like a dementia related uh, disease. But for the biomarker uh, detection could be the best solution to improve the patient journey of the Alzheimer disease or reactive like immune disease to achieve those of the decentralization purpose. Uh, but why is the biomarker? I think all the scientists here are familiar with that, but I just describe a little bit. Biomarker is the biological molecular found in our body through such as the blood, uh, tear and urea, urine. So that can help us to understand our status of a disease and, and health. Uh, our proper um, technology that uh, have uh, ultra sensitivity greater than traditional muscle of the ELISA uh, uh, um, over like 10, uh, 1,000 to 10,000. Um, and uh, there's a, uh, to help us uh, uh, prediction and non-invasive the health human uh, management. And the, the wild dynamic range can help us to, um, to monitor those of antibody drug treatment and disease uh, progression. And then uh, to introduce more about our um, company, we are the first uh, in the world combined the optic fiber microfluidy nanotechnology. So now we have uh, over 35 uh, global patents uh, distributed in uh, UK, US, mainland China, and Taiwan. And uh, we have uh, over 30 leading publications and uh, now it's still in, uh, increasing. Um, I think this year we have, have more than five uh, publications uh, um, that's on the way, okay? So the great uh, global traction that we've been working with uh, uh, different uh, institute, university, hospital, and uh, the biotech company. So why our technology is so uh, sexy and so attractive for those of the hospital clinician or those of the biotech company. Uh, let me introduce more deeply about our technology. As you can see, um, um, we have a two core technology. One is the FOPR, uh, the other in chip. So we, um, the FOPR uses uh, optical fiber with a narrow gold particle. Optical fiber has a perfect um, performance of a high speed and no reduction during the transmission. Therefore, when the light passes through into the optic fiber, the multiple refraction uh, will strengthen the signal. If the molecule and molecule are binding well, the signal will be detect the change. So we put these fiber sensor into this chip. Um, so uh, into this auto fluidy chip, the uh, fluidy chip without any pumping, tubing, and any waste. So they can provide a high performance and instant detection and easier of use. And then uh, later I will introduce two part. One is the analysis and the other is how do we detect and to apply the real world uh, diagnostic um, things. So for the first part of the life science that can apply to the antibody drug or the antibody antigen selection and the vaccine develop and also the biomarker ACEs. So, um, the based on the life science analysis that we have the uh, uh, affinity analysis and uh, to recognize those of the abiton beneficence and uh, we build up the uh, affinity database to compare with those of the affinity scenes can help the scientists to get uh, know their um, um, antibody and biomarker affinities ability. And then also the to um, to understand to help the antibody or antigen to give their um, performance analysis of the limited of detection and linear uh, dynamic range. And uh, also the, we are working on the pre-Western uh, block analysis. Uh, as we know that well, the Western block took a lot of time. So we would like to um, help the scientists uh, to pre-use our machine to screen their uh, expression labels before they apply a uh, text like a half days or one and half days to get the Western block data. And then once we have a deeper uh, analysis, then we apply to the detection part. 
So some of our clients that are applied to like uh, uh, rapid text or that um, when they develop the ELISA, they use our uh, analysis to uh, know more um, about the uh, antibody antigen or those buffer that BLT sees. And then uh, for us, we also um, have the benefit and uh, feature of the detection. Later, I will um, introduce the detection part of the reader, how to detect those of the ACEs. First, um, to uh, introduce our um, biomarker ACEs, why we need a proper analysis before immunology? As we know, the, I think we, we visit some of the scientists that we work with the traditional ELISA, uh, ELISA and then uh, they, they might ask a lot of things. Is how, how, how is um, our, uh, my, my antibody and antigen specificity and sensitivity and why um, the detection and the loss of the uh, data is not good? Because uh, some of the scientists that um, they purchased the, the antibody just follow the paper, follow those of the uh, laboratory of what they have uh, been used before. So there's a lot of the different things that um, when uh, that apply to a new a biomarker assay that they will cost a lot of the time. And so the idea just then you to know, let's back a little bit our laboratory works. As we know, the NGS is uh, quite um, familiar with a lot of the laboratory, but during around the, uh, I mean, the running through the NGS experiment that do a lot of the QC steps, for example, like a nail drop QB, Q, uh, Qbit, to do the size, to do the, uh, like a concentration check to do the loads of the um, uh, uh, detail check before they run through the um, NGS. But during this moment, um, I, I think the over 30 years, um, we do use the ELISA as the uh, analysis and downstream is the um, ELISA for the detection. So how we, um, we, we don't, we don't get those of the deeper uh, analysis of those of the antibody and antigen, but we directly apply to the low um, uh, ELISA detection. That's the reason why we waste a lot of time to um, to to find the um, result, the specificity or loss of the uh, sensitivity is not good. So our uh, claim is to do the deeper analysis through our licensing biomarker analyzer to um, well understand loss of the affinity, epitome binding, and the limited of detection and the linear dimensions, then uh, the downstream assay is the ELISA. So how we apply these assays, uh, it's quite easy. Just use the antibody um, mixed with the buffer and loading um, into our chip. So you only need to um, know the, the skill is the uh, pipetting skill, okay? So once the loading immobile with the covalent bond of the uh, bonding of, of the nail gold particle. And then uh, you can see the uh, curve, real time curve just right here. And then um, through that, uh, we after the next step is to um, uh, loading the analyze to do the detection. So you can see the binding curve just like this. I'm binding, I'm binding curve just, it's a fact. So we use this uh, uh, idea that we can get a lot of the analysis data. So let's back a little bit about the basic information of uh, affinity. Affinity that get a lot of the, how fast uh, does the um, two molecule binding together and also how fast a molecule um, um, fall apart. So that can help us to understand the affinity of a two molecule. So based on this, we use the AppCam um, antibody and also the IND uh, uh, antibody. That, uh, this, um, uh, uh, this uh, figure, that's the uh, re reason why the app can invite us because their antibody show that uh, have a very good um, affinity land IND system through our analysis because um, they have a good specificity and good stability and also um, their um, um, molecule and antibody uh, combination um, of the binding is uh, average higher than the uh, affinity of the database. So as you can see, why the RD system have a, a good specificity, but they are not um, um, go to the section one because the buffer will affect the loss of the stability things. So the other part of the analysis is the epitome binding. Our epitome binding um, is a little different than others. We use the full, uh, I mean, uh, in this one chip, one assay can analyze it at the same time 
of the four different antibodies. So which means we load the antibody um, uh, like an antigen and immobilize with a nanogold particle, and we just pipette one, um, one antibody flew in, and the second um, um, antibody will come after the uh, first antibody, and the third will come with the uh, uh, second. So as you can see, one of the example for you to know, one of the uh, company that uh, developed the COVID-19 antigen rapid test, I used our um, technology. As you can see, the first antibody and the second antibody and the third antibody, they all um, come through this one chip. And then uh, we can um, directly to understand the, um, their uh, antibody pair, which is uh, good and, and fit for the good combination for their rapid test. And then we already have a lot of the um, sample uh, uh, tests, for example, like uh, uh, hybridization with the loads of the antibody uh, 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 DNA or the protein or also the um, uh, uh, abdomen scenes or, and uh, the antibody and the protein scene. But all um, uh, published on our website and you can easy to process those, those information. And then I will go a little part of the detection part and for the biomarker detection, the, what's the difference between our technology and ours? As we know, there are lots of the different uh, technology that still need a lot of the watch step detection and incubation steps. For our ASICs, we only need uh, one of the things, it's the pipette in and uh, to uh, incubation and uh, stay for a while, and then you can get a lot of the result and can save the time and uh, provide a high performance. And there's a couple of um, detection methodology for you to know. Uh, one is a direct assay. Later I will show a, a real case for you to know. Direct assay is only need one antibody immobilized with, the, with our neurocode particle. And just through, through the uh, clinical sample, it can reach those of the um, sensitivity up to the neurogram per milliliter and also the sub uh, picogram per, per milliliter. And then the other, we have a, um, a polyethylene assay, which is used the two antibody, just like a sandwich assay. They can ach um, achieve those of the ultra sensitivity up to pentagram per milliliter. And also the other competition assays for the small molecule uh, assays. Those of the uh, methodology we have uh, already have uh, publications. Um, I will brief uh, in the Dutch um, uh, two of the uh, assays. One is the direct assay. As you can see, we only need one antibody and the uh, real case is we use the NIS through to detect those of TNF alpha uh, to see the how the different with the uh, traditional ELISA. As you can see the red line up here, um, you can see the ELISA has a narrow um, linear time range and ours the wild linear range and also the sensitivity uh, is better than the ELISA. And also the other biomarker is the MMP3 uh, with the same um, uh, result of the uh, uh, and performance uh, with the uh, wild linear range and uh, ultra sensitivity. And the last of the uh, application is the Folisa assay. Actually, the Folisa assay, the concept is quite easy, just like a sandwich. But um, based on our um, uh, full per um, plasma resonance, this kind of the um, uh, technology, uh, that the sandwich assay means a lot than us. Yeah, because uh, that we can achieve and down to the pentagram per meter. So one of the very good publication impact factor now, I think the, uh, it's around like 10 um, this year. And then the, this um, they can provide, the, we use a sepsis, these uh, diagnostic uh, uh, indication for, for the uh, uh, target and then can achieve the pentol uh, ground per milliliter. So the all of the process is to do the analysis and then um, to understand and set up the assay and then second, is to develop an AC develop and apply to the uh, uh, as a, a AC develop kit. So it's reading and detection, analysis and detection. That's all of our uh, simple idea. And then we have the uh, um, um, two channel, A channel, and uh, next year, uh, I think next year will come with a fully automatic uh, system uh, channels. So it's all based on our proper uh, chip. And uh, uh, with the, um, we also provide a service uh, for the global customer. So they, these are uh, my presentation. And thanks for your listening. We believe the like and set like. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you for your listening. Uh, thanks, Tony. Thank uh, for this wonderful presentation, and uh, it's it's really uh, good to know that how this technology is moving further for biomarker assays. And now I would like to actually move for questions that we may have some. And my first question will go actually to Dr. Kang uh, for the technology that they have they are working on uh, related to Eliza. My first question is that. Uh, you mentioned also about the COVID-19 in your presentation. So uh, my question is that what have, is there any work being done in your department or related to the implementation of this technology? Or are you planning in future to move towards that side? Because I understand you are more in the material bioscience development, which is actually the basic of any development or any new technology. In, in biotech and drug development. So that's actually quite interesting and would be, I would really like to know and maybe uh, like uh, uh, many other people who, who would be listening this that how it can help. Well, thanks for the question. And uh, uh, indeed, because uh, uh, I, I don't have a, uh, any bio, biology background actually. We, during the research, and uh, we, because we make different fibers and different materials, and uh, so we learn. And in fact, uh, uh, Yi and Bofeng are more uh, 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 knowledgeable in the biological science area. And I was listening to Dr. Chang's talk, the biomarkers, and uh, so, and uh, we, regardless, we all need to uh, have a biomarkers. The COVID-19, I think, uh, we collaborate with a medical center and they use their Delta variants and uh, I think the spike of proteins um, some of this, the biomarker they got. So I, I have no knowledge. And so we just find, have, we, we, we gather these things, we can um, um, immobilize onto our materials and try to detect. And also the strategy here is uh, um, because uh, the interest nowadays to the public would be uh, personal use. And um, personal use means that uh, in maximum you could only use your phone or personal device. So we have uh, the strategy and also that's the current the funding uh, uh, trend as well from US the uh, government because uh, um, uh, and so, um, so here is uh, any kind of materials that will be able to improve the sensitivity, reaching the level to your personal use. And um, that actually has some kind of merit to those funding agencies. So that's the one. And I, we do have a, a wide interest uh, and uh, basically uh, just myself, I guess, uh, well, from what you can add. So we want to see any other biomarkers that can be attached. But also, I know different biomarkers may have a specific structure uh, requirements because we are more uh, familiar with what would be the structural features of these materials and uh, fit suitable for different biomarkers, size of the biomarker, structure of the biomarker, and so on. So we're more specialized in these areas. But uh, we need to collaborate with uh, uh, other uh, researchers. Primarily here is uh, uh, on campus. So uh, for example, pesticides, we, we work with, uh, uh, we have a super fund program. They have a bioassay group. They develop all the nanobodies. And also uh, they, they, they have a, the, their, their antibodies developed for specific chemicals. So, so we, we just collaborate with them. Um, but I also purchase biomarkers. And I saw Dr. Tron's uh, uh, the presentation, the AB, I believe that the, most time I just approve the purchase. I just saw those, <laughs> the AB camp is, uh, is our uh, big supplier for different, uh, you know, uh, the agents. <laughs> um, so anyway, that, that, this is our, so we do have a huge interest for materials. This is the just because of our paper in the material science area, specifically for applications in those. Uh, this. We are also interested, I, I, I learned a lot from Dr. Trump's talk, and I think that's a, 
we would like to have such a device as a comparison, even though now we are more using the 96 well played reader as our uh, kind of standard uh, comparison. Uh, anyway, let's see. Okay, thanks, Sir. Again, that's very interesting. Of course, I mean, with COVID 19, as you mentioned, I'm sorry, there is some like, I think, ambulance or fire. They always <laughs> run here on University Avenue campus. So it's just running there. And well, our temperatures are super high. Today's record is a hundred something. Sorry? Yeah, Davis. Davis is a hundred. I think it's a hundred degrees. Yes. Uh, yes. Right. Wow. 40, 40, almost a 40 degrees. Yeah, wow, wow. Uh, also 90, 95 Celsius in Stanford area too. So okay, yeah. today is a hot in Bay Area, I know, because uh, I, I thought that the, the weather is, uh, but it's just today. To, Tomorrow will be cooler. <laughs> yeah, we wish that, right? Uh, yesterday was the same. But thanks for this answer. I mean, it's it's very interesting that uh, you uh, work with different collaborators depending on the biomarkers, and then you work on the material development, basically, which is very interesting. And uh, so my next question is for Tony. That um, what? So you your technology is very new and different, basically, compared to like. ELISA, different ELISA techniques, which are being used in different laboratories. My question is that, is there any flexibility in this technique that this technique can be adopted or customized according to the needs and the natures of the project, which many different PIs are doing and who are actually already using uh, other ELISA techniques? So can it be modified or can it, does it have a flexibility for to do that? Yeah, uh, I think that um, as I mentioned, uh, the, 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 I think um, the scientist, uh, uh, Dr. Gan, uh, mentioned about the um, lot of the uh, laboratory. I think the, the first is purchase the, the most expensive antibody, right? Because it's more easy to achieve the uh, high performance. So um, for us, uh, we, we, we are trying try to against this these idea, right? So. We will um, uh, highly recommend the scientists that are uh, all the those the laboratory uh, scientists that, that purchase the, the, the um, antibody to do the analysis first. So, so uh, doing this based on this uh, uh, idea is um, it's quite easy because the, you use the uh, our buffer system that can immobilize with the uh, uh, like FC region of the antibody. So. Um, every lab that can do this um, laboratory work by them by themselves, and then once the immobilized lab can do the antigen uh, through through the uh, those the second step. So it's quite easy to um, get those of the uh, analysis of affinity and also the epitome being those of uh, experiments. But for the detection part is because the for the detection part like uh, the red assay or sandwich assay in each of the laboratory, they need to, um, to do the assay develop for a while. Because uh, um, there's uh, some like, uh, for example, like a uh, serine or the other, maybe like agricultural loads of the uh, um, superintendent seed, there's uh, some interference that might uh, affect the, the result. So we need to optimize that um, in the lab or through our service. So there, there will divide two parts, one is to uh, analysis. The second is for the detection to develop those of the AC develop. But it's quite easy. If you uh, have the like more cone antibody, uh, even the polycone that can apply to our AC and, and analyzer um, directly. Thank you. Um, thanks, Tony. That's that's very interesting. So I think we have a, a really time limitation here. So I will go to my last questions to both of you. So first, I will start with Dr. Gang. That what do you think? Like we started this series to bring our academic and industrial partners, like on the table around the table, so that there can be some bridging which is missing usually when there is a res lots of research going on in academic sector, but there is a different approach going on in the commercial sector or in the business sector. So there is always a link which is missing there. So what do you think that uh, how important it is to have industrial and academic collaborations uh, for the research going on in uh, the labs as well as for the uh, commercial products or the rapid development of technology in industrial side. 
This is a very important question since we've been living in the academic uh, 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 environment for my life. And uh, also I have a lot of different technologies developed, a few of them and they become uh, and commercialized. But I do see there's a disconnection and between the academia research and, and from the industry. And a lot of companies probably don't know what we are doing. And also for us, we don't know the real life, the real world. And that, so there's no, well, we would appreciate, you know, I certainly appreciate this opportunity that at least we see uh, Dr. Chong and uh, also we see um, the, there's some kind of connection. And uh, maybe I think uh, I have a few of our researchers in, in my group, the Chen Yi and the Bo Feng, they probably also could hear um, and they learn that the biomarkers, particularly, because we have always issues try to find out what are the issues. And academic research mostly are driven by money and also funding agencies. So it's not the commercialization, but the commercialization would be a side product. But we would like to see it, the university wants to see it. But eventually, all the research here, we have to find the money to support the graduate students who are the workers in the lab. And uh, so our goal is uh, education. Our goal is to support the graduate study, the students. So I think, uh, uh, Noeem, you probably are familiar with this. But the industry actually is for making money. But I think that we do have a common interest that is uh, to make something and the useful for the society, for the people, and the benefit of the society, benefit of the users. So I, I guess, uh, yeah, we do need uh, the bridging components. And, uh, and yeah. Thanks, Oregon. I think that's very important. And I, I agree completely that bridging component that probably we had to talk today could be maybe our biomarker analysis, right? That biomarker assays that uh, instant nanobiosensor is also doing. And you also do sometimes with other PIs. So my next question is, last question actually for this session is to uh, Tony, like uh, what are the future uh, projects in pipeline that you think could be soon in uh, for for to be used in the labs. Uh, um, at this moment, that uh, uh, we do have a two channel, and then um, this year we will have a, a channel that use the AT pipe that you can easy to handle that. Um, uh, includes the loads of the throughput. And uh, um, next year, we will have, have a fully automatic test for the um, diagnostic machine is up to the 16. So the last for the machine um, uh, 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 like models. And then the, the ACE is that uh, we quite focused on the Alzheimer's disease. But um, based on that, uh, uh, our neural particle, we have uh, uh, like protein A or protein G uh, list kind of the uh, uh, like uh, molecule that can help the scientists so easy to uh, conjugation. But um, without the protein A that uh, you can directly use our buffers uh, to use like a covalent bond to do the FC region conjugation, I think it's quite easier. So um, it's a platform and also can be focused on uh, each of the application and uh, um, the uh, like a diagnostic. For, for example, like I just showed uh, what we already done in the past couple of is the um, application um, we've been we've been um do the it's not only the broad uh, serum and plasma but also some um, agriculture those of the uh, detection and uh, uranium detection for the um, drug detection and also for the those of the uh, food safety and environmental like uh, milk or water use the uh, um, aptamer um for um, to bind those of uh, the mental um, molecule things. I think this, this uh, will be published this year. And then um, for the use the um, service of the bacteria that we can detect those of the uh, bacteria uh, of the E. coli. And also the other is the serine and plasma and also the topical and, and tissue acids that we already done. So as a platform that we can do a lot of things, but as a, um, uh, indication of the use that we were focused on the Alzheimer disease. And then we do uh, have a, a cooperation with uh, some Euro um, uh, Alzheimer Institute, big institute that uh, we uh, co-host a large uh, 
uh, scale of the, uh, the clinical samples. That's what we, our pipeline and milestone. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. That also shows a lot like broader applications of this technique. And with that note, actually, I think we are already three minutes uh, more. We already took for our like uh, session time. And I would like to really say thanks to Dr. Gang and also Tony to both of you for coming here and to share this technology, your technologies with us. And I will be, this session will be like, as already recorded and I will upload it maybe within two days on YouTube channel. And I will share the link with both of you and you can share it with your peers, your researchers, if they would like to go back and listen to this presentation, depending on their time, because I can understand that when researchers work in the lab, they have, there is no time basically, no specific time schedule and they cannot go by the like a, a defined well-defined timetable it can be any times you know so whenever they have time they can go and they can watch the sessions and they can if they will have any questions then of course definitely or if anyone asks me any question i will direct to both of you and i really hope that we can see each other in future too in at some platform and uh, uh, also i would yeah, like I, will, I will visit uh, san francisco um meet of june maybe the, if uh, dr again has the time that uh, i would at least to have a more discussion <laughs> yeah, come to visit the davis welcome you at any time yeah davis. yeah not, far, not yeah. too far two hours driving <laughs> <laughs> No, no problem. That, that will be because I will attend the U.S. Uh, bio convention in San Diego, and then I will uh, fly to San Francisco. So um, because there are some, uh, some conversion in Silicon Valley, so uh, if you have time and and just okay. want to visit you, yeah, thanks. Sure, welcome. Okay, um, thank you. I think we can then put both of you in contact later. On yeah, that. thank you. Sure, and nice meeting you. And I would wish all of you a very good day and take care and uh, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.